you all for joining us for our Diversity and Dialogue, the first ever Zorian Institute Poetry Night. If this is your first time joining us for one of our Zorian Institute events, um, the Zorian Institute is a nonprofit organization that raises awareness on issues related to genocide, human rights, and diaspora homeland relations. Some of the Institute's major projects include an annual two-week Genocide and Human Rights University program, which is actually coming up this August, happening virtually this year, and the publication of two academic journals, Genocide Studies International and uh, Diaspora, a Journal of Transnational Studies. And I have a copy here today. Uh, these are both published in partnership with the University of Toronto Press. So before we begin, I would like to share that this event was not only created as a way to celebrate poetry and dialogue, but also as an opportunity for you to support the work of the Zorian Institute. Uh, we encourage you to help us continue our important work by making a donation to zorianinstitute.org donate. And another way to help the Institute is by purchasing one of our recent publications. Um, one of them being the Zorian Institute art book, Forces and Factors. I also have a copy here, um, which, uh, which features poetry and artwork. Um, or the Chinese diaspora, its development and global perspective. This event was first inspired by the Forces and Factors book, which features international artists and poets showcasing themes of diaspora, genocide, and human rights through their creative work. The Chinese diaspora, its development and global perspective is an accessible and valuable text for anyone studying or interested in the Chinese diaspora. The collection features three overarching areas that both shape and are shaped by um, by the diaspora, including culture, entrepreneurship, and migration. And now more than ever, due to the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes and discrimination, education about Chinese communities and dias diaspora groups at large is extremely important. Um, and mo moreover, both of these publications are actually currently discounted, so it is a great time to get your copy today. My colleague will be posting more about this in the chat box, so keep an eye out for that. There will be a direct link to purchase your copy. And to start us off today, to quote UNESCO World Poetry Day, practiced throughout history in every culture and on every continent, poetry speaks to our common humanity and our shared values, transforming the simplest of poems into a powerful catalyst for dialogue and peace. To start the night off, we are so lucky to have Prof Professor Alina Garabegian, our host, who will be providing us with an academic perspective on poetry and literature in just a few minutes. And then we'll have three unique and highly talented poets, Teodros Abeba, Alan Whitehorn, and Phoebe Wang, will be sharing their work. We will then have a question and answer period with the poets following their readings, and we encourage you to put your own questions for them in the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. So thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm now pleased to introduce our host for tonight, Professor Alina Garabegian. She is an associate professor of English at New Jersey City University, where she has been a faculty member since 2009, mm. and where she served as department chair between 2014 and 2017. Her training is in Victorian literature, Victorian poetry and poetics more specifically, in modern poetry and in elegy as a poetic genre. At New, Jer New Jersey City University, she teaches Victorian literature and history of ideas English Romanticism, Modern Poetry, and Composition. Alina, welcome. We are so grateful to have you here with us today. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much to the Zorian Institute and to Jenna and Megan, more specifically, for their kind invitation and for organizing this lovely event. Thanks also to our poets who are here to share their poetry with us this evening and to all the participants, our guests. I'm really delighted to be here to help facilitate tonight's conversation with our poets. Um, I've been asked to supply just a bit of context for the conversation before we immerse ourselves in the poetry. My own training being in British literature, um, I'll be coming at things from that somewhat delimited perspective with respect for other traditions, obviously, with which I don't have the same measure of familiarity and with the understanding that these poetic traditions clearly are not covered under the paradigm of the Western tradition. And of course, I'll be doing so with, uh, with the broadest of strokes. So I ask for your indulgence and I hope to learn from today's poets and audience members. I'll start then with the Romantics. 
um, I think we can reasonably argue that the specter of the romantic lyric voice has been with us for the better part of nearly 250 years in poetry from all over the world and from various traditions, obviously. That is, we are still, in a sense, post-romantic in our poetics in, I think, very interesting ways. We understand lyric poetry at its, ba at its base as poetry that is non-narrative, non-dramatic, non-epic, that expresses the poet's state of mind. Of course, lyric poetry with its rich, varied, protean history. Um, sorry, I lost my spot. Um, protean history has been around since time immemorial in ancient Greece, in Japan, in China, Persia, India, in Russia, and certainly quite predominantly throughout Europe from the 16th century onward. But it's not until the Romantics that we have the centralized sort of lyric eye at the heart of the poem, whose primary concern is the interiority of the poet. So we locate the provenance of that gaze inward in Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the Rousseauian privileging of the individual with the belief that individuals are important in their own right. Married to this emerging idea of the unique individual or the value of personhood considered apart from the social unit was the romantic uh, reaction against enlightenment, enlightenment thinking, against an over-reliance on reason, the scientific method, empirical knowledge about the world of phenomenon. So with the swing of the pendulum away from enlightenment toward romanticism, in steps worship of the chaotic imagination and all its possibilities, you have a reliance on intuition, a renewed belief in metaphysical possibilities, and the human capacity for sublimity, improvisation, spontaneity. How do I feel? Was a central and largely unprecedented question for Rousseau and the Romantics. The neoclassical art of the 18th century that preceded the Romantics marked a return to ideals such as order, harmony, symmetry, restraint, and re-emphasized the mimetic quality of art, art that imitated the external human world through mimesis. In contradistinction, the romantic William Wordsworth's definition of poetry as the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings signals a turning point in literary history, a turning away from this neoclassical ideal of mimetic art with a turn to expressive, imaginative art or poetry. If the source of poetry is the individual artist's interiority, then first person lyric poetry is accorded a certain unprecedented prominence. As Professor Lilia Milani writes, romanticism transformed Western culture in many ways that survive into our own times. It is only very recently that any really significant turning away from romantic paradigms has begun to take place. And I'm not sure that even that is true, that we have in any meaningful way shed the ineluctable influence of romantic, romantic subjectivity of the lyric I, that we have moved away from a poetics of personal emotion and inspiration in this, the 21st century, generally considered. Theoretically, a hiatus in English poetry from this intensely inward gaze came by way of the Victorians who followed the Romantics, and they too continued in the lyric voice, but now far more sort of self-consciously and with a self-consciousness that we often associate with the emergence of modernity in the 20th century. In his elegiac poem, Stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse, Grieving the End of an Era, Victorian Matthew Arnold speaks directly back to his forebears, the Romantics, and says, what helps it now that Byron bore with haughty scorn which mocked the smart through Europe to the Aetolian shore the pageant of his bleeding heart, that thousands counted every groan and Europe made his woe her own. It's a series of questions that evokes the importance of the poet's role as a representative of the people, as a representative voice in the struggle for social change, arguably. And it signals a distinction between the image of the solipsistic romantic poet, the wanderer above the sea of fog in Caspar David Friedrich's famous painting, who stands above and apart from the societal fray and writes about the pageant of his bleeding heart. And the poet, on the other hand, who having inherited the romantic's distress as Arnold has, is left now to ameliorate the condition of society, turning away from his own subjectivity as poetic material and turning instead to social concerns. This is the divided poet, Wallace Stevens Marks, 
between, or the divide that he marks between what he calls the aesthetic separation and social engagement. But the Romantics were not in fact solipsistic writers cloistered away from social issues. They were cultural revolutionaries, vibrant active members of society engaged in political causes and debates. Their poetry was not the over-refined expression of their feelings about birds and the wind and Grecian urns. The very early Romantic William Blake constructs an entire cosmology, a whole body of mythology to help point the way out of society's ills through visionary prophecy, thereby delineating the role of the poet prophet in people's lives. The case of the Romantics gives the lie to the long held and still sometimes persistent dichotomy, perhaps a very false dichotomy between on the one hand, the purely literary or artistic and on the other, the socio-political concerns of poetizing. When in his seminal essay, A Defense of Poetry, the Romantic poet Percy Shelley accords to poets the highest esteem by calling them the unacknowledged legislators of the world. He is at once ascribing to them the role of representative and assigning to poetry a social function. So when we trace the genealogy of lyric subjectivity and art for art's sake, all the way back to its source, to the Romantics, even there we see the stirrings of the contrapuntal tendency to look outward, expand, include, open up, take in, to make the world more collaborative and more communal via poetry. A brief look at the subjectivity apparent in much of late 20th and 21st century poetry in English reveals that we have lost the self-consciousness of the Victorians in producing lyric poetry as well as the modernists, the modernists coming after the Victorians, the modernists anti-romantic imperative to read and interpret a poem as an object almost entirely decontextualized from its socio-historical context and from the biographical matter of the writer, from personality. That is, the modernists believed in an impersonal poetry over and against the highly personality-driven poetry of the romantics. All of which is to say the lyric voice and the poet's subjectivity run as strong as ever in poetry written in English in the English language this very day. Clearly some portion of that fact owes its existence to movements like the Harlem Renaissance in the first half of the 20th century, to the beat poetry and to confessional poetry of the 1950s and 60s in the US. The Harlem Renaissance in particular carved out a space of poetics at once highly personal and highly sociocultural and in formulating a self portrait of African American life, it unequivocally galvanized and informed the shape of American culture, American culture writ large, and the role of the socially and politically active poet. In the late 20th and 21st centuries, the avant-garde tendencies and tenets of poetic movements like that of the language poets who theorize and poeticize the erasure of the poet speaker they want the poet speaker to fade away by underscoring the reader and her role, and of the conceptualists who deny the poem as original object to showcase instead the process of creation. You don't have to read a conceptualist's poem, you just have to think about the concept of it. Um, even they do not in any way succeed in attenuating the force of the lyric voice. The question of poetry's functionality has a very long history. Um, in the Western tradition, going as far back as Plato and disparate and opposing views have abounded in the literary critical world for some 2400 years now since Plato. In 2006, Poetry Magazine, one of the premier poetry journals in the English speaking world, asked a group of four award winning poets the question, does poetry have a social function? The resulting article containing their dialogic responses is fascinating to read for the varied and even oppositional responses that despite their antithetical positions seem the very picture of truth about poetry and its functionality. The upshot is that you cannot get two or more poets to agree on anything about poetry, it seems. But I'd like to suggest that there are in fact a number of attributes intrinsic to poetry that might yield some measure of agreement from poets that argue for the instrumentality of poetry in the sociocultural enterprise. This list, of course, does not pretend to exhaustiveness. Firstly, poetry is sometimes considered the highest art form because of its intermedial potentialities. That is, it can unify other art forms through its capacity to be at once visual and sonic, rhythmical, musical, physical, sensual, semantic. 
It has the emotional range of drama, some have said, and it draws from philosophy, religion, history. It helps shape national and cultural identity. It also mediates the sliver of space between abstract thought and expression because its medium is language. Hence, it is potentially accessible to all. Secondly, poetry is transportive, wherein resides its capacity for empathetic identification and the effacement of alterity. That is the ability of poetry to carry us out of our own interiority and into another's allows us to potentially be and feel and think with them. Here is the power of poetry to quicken our empathy, its most ethical claim. This transportive dimension also arguably facilitates transhistorical and cross-cultural identification. Three, poetry is transformative. In the project of social change by engaging our imaginations, poetry aids the process of imagining another world and other futures. It provides an aesthetic, peace-building aesthetic vehicle for raising awareness. In other words, it uses sweetness to deliver light. In portraying the outlines of our current moment, placing society squarely and frankly before a mirror, poetry can also show us the way out or warn us about what's ahead. This is the prophetic character of poetry. Number five, poetry, much like the other arts, offers a stage to otherwise unheard and marginalized voices. By marshalling poetic devices on various registers, images, symbols, sonic tools, formal qualities, and by using intense figurative language to communicate sensory, conceptual, and aesthetic realities in an often compact space, and to do so in a temporal mode, right? It takes time to read poetry. It's not like uh, fine art. Poetry arrogates for itself the capacity for a unique human experience. Number seven, poetry's immediate, that is its unmediated or maybe barely mediated access to the world of feelings by way of emotive expression stimulates and enlivens the affective realities of both poet and reader. This element of intersubjectivity in poetry opens the space for aesthetic reciprocity. As poet Lucille Clifton writes, writing poetry is a way of continuing to hope Perhaps for me, it is a way of remembering I am not alone. And lastly, since the end of the 19th century, since well before Nietzsche's 1882 pronouncement that God is dead, the progressive secularization of the Western world had left a spiritual void that poetry stepped in, arguably, to fill. In addition to being cathartic then, poetry became also salvific providing spiritual sustenance and perhaps redemption. As Robert Frost so profoundly says in his essay, The Figure a Poem Makes, poetry, he writes, begins in delight and ends in wisdom, in a clarification of life, not necessarily a great clarification such as sects and cults are founded on, but in a momentary stay against confusion, a momentary stay against confusion. So then the question remains, how do we mobilize all these unifying qualities of poetry and bring them to the service of our socio-historical moment here? If as literary critic Marjorie Perloff says, postmodernism begins in the urge to return the material so rigidly excluded from poetry, that is the political material, ethical material, historical, the philosophical, to return all these to the domain of poetry she theorizes that that is part of the project of postmodernity. How, given the still predominant lyric voice and the intensely inward gaze, do we actuate the unifying functionality of poetry, first as poets and next as readers in the 21st century? One very cogent response to this question is offered by the poet Joseph Fasano, who says that if the lyric poem can claim as its ambition a discovery of the universal in the particular experience, whether that experience is actually lived or imagined, then surely the poem is a success. The universal with the particular juxtaposed, the universal contained within the particular, the particular speaking to and evoking the universal. 
Surely it is within the horizon of what literary critic Jahan Ramazani calls the ocean straddling energies of the poetic imagination to achieve such a balance. But vigilant now in the 21st century of exploitation, cultural appropriation, the rhetorical and even tokenistic use of the label multicultural, how do we give voice to the particular in ways that make use of the functionality of poetry as a unifying force that tap into or conjure the universal while keeping our particularity, our unique identity intact? And that's a general question I'd like to pose to all of the poets tonight. Without further ado, I would like to present this evening's poets. First, Professor Whitehorn. Alan Whitehorn is a poet and emeritus professor of political science at the Royal Military College of Canada located in Kingston. He is the grandson of an orphan of the Armenian genocide. He was born in Portsmouth, United Kingdom in 1946 and immigrated to Canada in 1953. In the mid 1990s, he was the first holder of the J.S. Woodsworth Chair in Humanities at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. As an academic, he writes on the topics of genocide, human rights, the South Caucasus, political parties and elections. As a poet, he explores the issue of genocide and its impact on Armenian identity. His books include The Armenian Genocide, Resisting the Inertia of Indifference, Ancestral Voices, Identity, Ethnic Roots and the Genocide Remembered, Just Poems, Reflections on the Armenian Genocide, Return to Armenia, Veradarts de Bihayastan, and an edited volume published in 2015 called The Armenian Genocide, The Essential Reference Guide. Professor Whitehorn. Thank you, Alina. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, I want to thank the, the Zorian Institute for this invitation. I am been very grateful for the last several decades. The Institute has been an inspiration to me in its human rights work and, and of course, work on, on genocide. As the grandson of an orphan of the genocide, I've tried to understand the um, indescribable and the reasons for the cause of genocide. Um, as a political scientist, you know, you try to understand things through analytical models, but I also realized that the personal story is key. And my family history has been part of uh, what I use to uh, explain the Armenian genocide to uh, facing history groups, teachers, and, and general audiences. Now, as Alina may have mentioned, uh, Just Poems, Reflections on the Armenian Genocide was published in response to the Turkish government's denialist activities in trying to silence me and threaten the Canadian government. So when we talk about denialism, it can be very active and, and quite threatening. Now, the three poems I've selected for tonight are taken from the book, Just Poems. And the, the first one is called One. Uh, one historic year, one cataclysmic event, one unforgettable bleak memory, one ominous political concept, one people almost annihilated, one bloodstained color. One orphan child, and then another, and still another. Somehow a nation survives. One extended family grows. One searing memory penetrates to the bone. One horrific deed, now a people's defining identity. One people unable and unwilling to forget. One terrible deed and endless nightmares it did beget. We do not forget that one historic year, one catastrophic event that defines who I am and who I always will be now and forever. The second poem <clears throat> relates to the Armenian Genocide Memorial in Yerevan, and it's surrounded by uh, forest, the eternal flame, and, and the memorial and the museum are surrounded by forests and uh, very much influenced by the Armenian Tree Project, trying to plant trees in Armenia in part as a remembrance to the victims of, of genocide and in part for other reasons, environmental mostly. 
Um, this, this poem's called Trees Across Armenia. To plant a tree for every genocide victim, 150,000 trees a year for 10 long years. It seems such a mammoth task. It is only then that I realize the magnitude, the horrific magnitude, the colossal magnitude of the slaughter of so many. So swiftly, one and a half million in a little more than a year. So much killing, so directed, so planned, so executed, so swift. It will take at least 10 years to plant the young trees. It will take more than a lifetime for the seedlings to grow fully. It will take generations for the scars to heal properly. The rugged landscape will always reveal the bitter truth. But one million and a half trees will ease the pain. A forest will lessen the suffering and hide the tears of sorrow of so many. The tears of so many yesterday, today, and tomorrow, yesterday, and the day after. The tears perhaps will water the trees of hope, the trees of love, the trees of beauty, the trees of peace, the trees of salvation, even the healing trees of forgiveness. Listen to the leaves of the trees as they rustle in the wind. A million and more souls whisper in unison. This is our forest. This is your ancestors forest. Visit us when you can. Remember us as you should. Plant a tree for us and for others. Plant a tree and remember. The third and final poem <clears throat> relates to a trip I took to Armenia in 2005. And I was visiting the Yerevan State University Library. And I decided to donate a copy of a book that Lauren Shrinin and I had uh, co-authored on the Armenian genocide that had been used uh, as part of uh, uh, the lobbying and the influence on the Canadian parliamentarians in recognition of the Armenian genocide. The poem is called A Small Gift. As I step into the huge entranceway of the State University Library, I have a sense of grand architectural design but as I look at the old fashioned type library card catalog, I realize funds and books are far too scarce. My solitary book now seems far too inadequate. I should have brought much more. Still, I offer my special gift to the librarian. It is my very personal book on the genocide. In so doing, a grandson pays respect to his grandmother. Metz Mama, this volume is in memory of you and all the other orphans. I should have offered more, like so many others then, I should have offered more. I should have offered more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, our next poet is Teodros Abebe, born and raised in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Teodros Abebe's poetry mostly focuses on human and national issues tied to his native land. Teodros's collection of Amharic poetry titled Fetena was received, has received great reviews and is mentioned in various literary works. As a bilingual, Teodros has also written several commentaries which were published in the Washington Post, the Africa Report, The Economist, and other English language publications. Teodros currently lives in the United States and serves as the senior archivist at Howard University in Washington, DC. His pastime includes stamp collecting, a hobby which he started to pursue as a teenager in Ethiopia. Teodros. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Alina, and I, I truly appreciate the uh, the uh, scholarly uh, uh, in, uh, introduction you gave at the beginning of the program. Um, let me begin by thanking the Zorian Institute of Canada for inviting me to this important event. Um, also, um, before I read my uh, my poems, uh, let me say a few things about poetry. Uh, in my view, poetry in any language has the power to, to connect humanity, to bring us together, to serve as an effective medium of expression. As humans, all of us share feelings and emotions of wide spectrum. Poetry has the power to capture those emotions, no matter how delicate or hard they are. To say a little bit about my uh, background, um, uh, I was born and raised in Ethiopia, as uh, the professor mentioned. Uh, English is my second language. Uh, my first language is Amharic, that's the national language of Ethiopia. And Ethiopia is a nation of uh, fascinating history with its own writing system and uh, sophisticated, in my view, literary heritage. Uh, uh, we have documents and uh, written history of over 3,000 years. Uh, poetry manifests in the daily lives of Ethiopians through numerous venues and occasions, both in public and in private. Poetic expressions are present in all aspects of life. What compels me to write poetry? I would say several factors, including humanity, past and present realities, issues of justice or injustice, paradoxes, lack of government accountability, the denial of God-given rights, and many other issues. And speaking of human rights, uh, like our Armenian brothers and sisters, we Ethiopians know about the uh, horrors of genocide and still feel the pain of it. What Ethiopia experienced during fascist Italy's invasion back in 1935, which lasted until 1941, is unspeakable. Unfortunately, that tragedy, similar tragedies re repeating itself in today's Ethiopia, brutal attacks targeting specific groups, particularly Maharas and Orthodox Christians, have occurred regularly during the past few years. The international community, therefore, must come together and stop any form of ethnic cleansing in any part of the world. In this regard, I truly appreciate the work that the Zorian Institute is doing through its scholarly publications and programs like this. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Now I will go to my uh, poems. I selected three poems from my book titled Katana. I'll begin with the one titled Mother or Anat, our origins that we all love our, that's one universal uh, truth, truth about all humans, I guess. We are very close to our mothers. We love our mothers. So uh, I wrote this uh, for my mother, at the same time for my own country of birth, Ethiopia, both can be uh, mothers in two different ways. So uh, uh, I'll read it now. Again, English is my second language. So uh, I translated this, you know, of course in translations, she was a lot of, <laughs> sometimes she was a lot of uh, uh, the emotions that you put into the original piece. So, uh, but uh, uh, I tried to keep the meaning 
the meaning, the, the essence of the poem as, as intact as possible. So I'll, I'll, I'll read the poem. Neither my written words nor those that I can utter will ever be enough to praise my mother. She's my source whose name I proudly sing, the foundation of my identity, the essence of my being. She's my pillar, the pillar of generations, a stream of pure love, a trove of patience, a treasure box of grace, a cornerstone, a cornerstone of endurance. Yes, mother, the motherland, your kindness, your helping hands, nourishing me, empowering me. What adjective, what analysis, which master brush, what verses and prose would be adequate to describe you, to depict your essence? What shall I call you? What name should I designate as a fitting accolade? What language would be enough to deny your generosity? None, neither my written words nor those that I can utter would ever be enough. Praised my mother. That's the first poem. Second one um, is a piece titled uh, Patana. That's the by the way, that's the title of the book. Uh, my book. And uh, when I the equivalent of that word is uh, tribulation, could be challenge, test. Um, so. Uh, just when I think of the problems that my the country, Ethiopia, went through, and I lived, I was born and raised during, uh, I mean, I spent most of my life in Ethiopia under a military dictatorship. dictatorship. So I was, and after that, you know, I left the country, but, you know, the government that replaced the military government was even worse. So. I wrote this piece uh, with that frame of mind. It goes like this. Is, is, is this an era of uncertainty and betrayal, divisiveness and defeat, shallowness and suspicion, decadence and deceit? Is this an era of challenges, of intimidating magnitude that nullify our gains, that weaken our strength, that dim our lights of hope. Is this the time for, for our eyes to be closed, our hearts to be cold, our foundation to erode, our heritage to be abandoned? Is this the time's fault or is it ours? Are we the ones who shaped the time, who nurtured it with our silence, with our indifference, with our carelessness? with our negligence? Are we the ones who let our guards down, who allowed evil to grow while letting the good to slip away? Is it we or the time at fault? We. The third piece is about uh, migration or uh, Displacement. Uh, so um, I just okay. I titled it exile. It goes like this: As I as I look inward from a faraway land, across the oceans, pondering, asking, debating with myself, I say, displacement is like a school where resolve, strength, endurance are tested, where self-worth and vision are shaped, where wishes and dreams are solidified, where hopes and aspirations blossom. If, however, being displaced, losing oneself, if it means self-loathing, futile attempt to be someone else, if it becomes a routine of pretense, 
one that makes you despise your roots, your mother tongue, your origin, then it becomes a misfortune. No, being displaced is not a curse. Losing your identity is. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Teodros. Our next poet is Phoebe Wang. Uh, Phoebe Wang is a writer and educator based in Toronto. Her debut collection of poetry, Admission Requirements, appeared with McLeland and Stewart in 2017 and was shortlisted for the Jared Lampert and Pat Lowther Memorial Award and nominated for Trillium Book Award. Her second collection of poetry, Waking Occupations is forthcoming in spring 2022. She is currently a mentor with Diaspora Dialogues and she will be serving as writer in residence at the University of New Brunswick in fall 2021. She works at OCAD University as a writing and learning consultant for English language learner students. Phoebe. Um, thank you so much, Elena, and also for your very stimulating um, contextual remarks earlier. I was an English major, so really um, kind of spoke to my roots. I'm a huge fan of Blake um, as well. And I also thank you to the Zorian Institute for this invitation, to Jenna um, for facilitating and hosting tonight, and also to my fellow poets. Um, really wonderful to to meet you both, um, Ellen and Todros, and I hear so many common threads and themes, um, even though we're from such different backgrounds. Um, so I will read a poem from um, my first collection, Mission Requirements. And it um, kind of tells the story of my father. My parents came to Canada from Hong Kong in the 1970s, I was born. Um, in Ottawa on the traditional territory of the Algonquin and the Shinabe. Um, and so these were some of the stories I heard when they uh, were in university in um, uh, Kitchener, Waterloo. My dad was studying chemistry at Waterloo. My mom was studying graphic design um, in um, Conestoga. And they were married for like 10 years before they had, they had you know, children. So, um, you know, they, they had gathered a lot of stories of um, the cold winters. So um, this one's called The Same Old Story. Where did it come from, this fantasy of shaping a life the way an axe splits white pine into tinder? Some of us were told a single story, others many. I thought it romantic, those fields de roi, their trunks packed for a life of linen sheets hemmed by terror. We've all heard about those people who came here with nothing. Well, my mother was an unwanted daughter too. I've been told on countless occasions about my dad digging his way out of shoulder high snow in Waterloo, shuttling cheese pizzas to University Avenue. Did it drive them mad to listen to the bitter, kicking, the bitter wind kicking at the door again? Not them, but us when we first came here and heard that howling, that danger we've since forgotten. I read this book when I was 13 about the field of Wa and it made like such a big impression on me. Um, it seemed like such a terrifying thing, thing to do. And um, it also refers to the fact that my mother's the oldest of um, four brothers. Um, and, you know, both my parents came to Canada not by, you know, force, they weren't refugees that came here by choice and they had so much difficulty that it's not hard for me to imagine um, the plight of people who do have to, you know, leave their homes very suddenly. Um, um, the next two poems I'm going to read are from my forthcoming collection. And the first uh, one that is from there is called For the Split Cell. And so kind of um, an obad, but a reimagined one. I wrote about like 20 of these obads and um, a no bad a traditional form about um, usually two lovers separating at dawn. And uh, maybe the most famous one would probably be um, uh, the Romeo and Juliet speech where Romeo has to take leave. But here I imagine the self uh, having to be divided um, from maybe an imaginary country or, or for me, this, the speaker of this poem is imagining being divided from um, an image of Canada as multicultural that doesn't serve anymore. 
So this is called For the Split Self. Why do I cling to it, that shadow country? It was a veil, kind and warm as linen, but easily cleaved. When I open my eyes, the shimra dissipates in autumnal light, and though a single version of events was not the legacy I presumed upon, it was pleasant there with earmarked landscapes. I would have remained had not my body evacuated me from my mind's stateless borders, its collapsing vestibules. I've been aware of a patchiness, a thinning in the opacity and the white noise generator in the well-meaning intentions and loophole treaties. For one thing, I wasn't a match for my surroundings, my skin in quiet revolt, my face a murmur. But I've had enough of being neither here nor there, prone as a fish between the coming wave and a com comatose cynicismry. How weary it is to be a deportee of a dismantled aftermath and how much it costs. When I rise, it will be a rupture with that passive woman who is bathed in golden light yet insists, this is not the day of tumult. You will not throw off your assigned role. There are protocols to follow before the sites are bruised, the systems discontinued. The alarm is setting, a mechanism I set to end the dream of intactness. Um, and the last poem I read is also a kind of elegy. Um, you know, I'm kind of calling them um, shadow elegies and also wrote, um, you know, about 10 or 12 of these. And I wrote, I finished this one really recently. This was just finished about a week ago. It was the kind of a new edition because I'm currently in edits um, for, for the new, new book. Um, and um, it's, uh, you know, I've been a tutor for a long time. I was, I tutored, started tutoring was my undergrad and then um, kind of transitioned into ESL teaching and then my current role as a writing consultant uh, in tutoring international students and uh, students whose first language is in English at OCAD. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of a elegy to some of the losses that they, they're leaving behind, some of the ghosts that they leave behind when they come, come to Canada. Uh, and it's a little bit about my mother too, who um, was taken out of school when she was 13 to um, help support her family. And she worked uh, in garment factories and um, making, you know, motherboards and electronics um, from the age of 13 to 18 when she came to Canada. So this is called Without Generations. Every stitch the same length. My mother thoughtlessly maintains the uniformity of each sleeve and seam. At 17, her girlhood is deducted at the end of the month. There are duties charged to the blouses I order online, black blouses, multi-purpose, which I wear while on indistinguishable subways towards tutoring centers scented with milk tea, where students unpack knapsacks of expectations sewn in Taiwan, and pull up Nike hoodies over t-shirts bedazzled in India, Hong Kong, and Turkey. Their Samsungs and iPhones chime like birds, carrying them away from assignments that ask for an exposition of the main ideas, for analysis in their own words of the stylistic features of the avant-garde or the Italian futurists. I take the stairs and mistaken in the elevator for a student. They swarm out in narrow columns, clutching paper cups of French rose coffee, acorn color fial wrapping bags, and Vuitton purses. I translate for them the slush streets, coarse descriptions, offhand comments swirling through corridors like snow. I warn them of flu season, their reduced immunity. They tap on screens to receive wire transfers to start the wheel of downloads, to register their aspirations. Their fathers oversee the production of health devices, calibrate settings, and maintain the flow of exports of lenses, flash memory drives, and multi-core processors. At 21, my mother inked mock-ups in Cooper, Windsor, and Times New Roman. 
I tell the story of correcting her copy while she scrolled over templates until her lamps made another moon in the dark. How she worked so I might take a shortcut through the campus, lit at night like a beehive, each cell a hex of efficiency and forged sweetness. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you all. Thank you, Phoebe. Thanks very much. Uh, I see Celeste has written in the chat. Thank you so much, Alan. It is wonderful to hear your video or your voice inhabiting your powerful poems. And I agree with Celeste uh, wholeheartedly. I think it's wonderful to hear. It's one thing uh, to read a poem and it's another to hear it read. Um, it's wonderful to hear all three of you read your poems. I'm going to jump into the questions. Um, the questions that the audience has posed, uh, I think those are the most important ones. And uh, perhaps we'll start with uh, one for Teodros. We're all wondering about the whole process of translation. Um, I posed a question about that. Uh, Jenna has posed a question about that. And now we have an audience member who poses the same question or a similar question. Uh, Robert Frost famously said that uh, poetry is what is lost in translation. <laughs> and I wonder what you think about that and uh, what some of your challenges are in translate in, in the process of translation. Uh, what is lost and what is gained? Yes, yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I agree with the Frost's assessment, I think. It's right. Um, it's the right uh, thing to say. Um, the process of translating is, uh, is uh, a little bit uh, complicated. Well, you, you see a piece, like I, I've translated a few uh, English language poems into Amharic, um, uh, particularly uh, the ones that I uh, translated uh, from the Harlem, Harlem Renaissance uh, period. And uh, when you see a piece, uh, as I read it, I mean, since I'm a bilingual, I read it and I can connect it to my own um, background, my own language. I read it and I understand it in Amharic, <laughs> you, you can say that. And that prompts me to, to, to translate it. And you capture the, the um, essence of that piece and you can put it, I and mean, it's it's not going to be like that in terms of beauty or aesthetics. It it's not going to be the same, but you get the idea. You, you have the right words for it in the other language, and uh, uh, I focus on the main thing is that what is what is the message, the central theme of what is of what is the essence of that the piece that I'm reading. Uh, and uh, of course, you worry about the quality of language, the quality of words, the words that we select have to uh, match uh, the, uh, the beauty or, or greatness of that, uh, of the message. So I focus on the message and uh, try uh, to uh, construct uh, form or just put it. Uh, poetically in the, the other language. So uh, the, the, the main uh, point is to get, you know, to identify what the main message is like to uh, really, you have to feel it. You have to, uh, uh, you have to really like it. Uh, uh, you, you have to identify uh, its essence, uh, put it in the other line, into, to translate it another language. So uh, when I translate my own poems written you know, in, uh, in Arabic into English, uh, that's the main thing. Just I focus on the main message of it. It's not, it's not a literal translation, but I try to keep it close to, to that literal uh, translation. But the, the main thing is just focus on the main message and uh, just find the right words the you know, quality words to uh, to do justice to that poem that you, you, you translate. Uh, you, you try to keep it as close to the original as possible. 
So yeah. that, that, that's, that's how I do it. Thank you, Todros. Thank you very much. Um, I'm guessing that I, I have no familiarity with Amharic, but I'm guessing that the uh, formal qualities, formal elements of Amharic poetics, um, there's not a lot of overlap with uh, English, so that uh, it would be very difficult to. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. So you focus on the content, on translating the content. Con con content, yes, yeah, because that's usually I write very rhythmic. Uh, uh like lyrical type of uh, poetry in you know, Amharic and uh when you trans when you translate that into English uh, you lose okay. that that rhythmic quality but uh, but uh, yes yeah, yeah. you're okay. right. right thank you very much uh, a question for Alan. Uh, fantastic poems, um, the uh, audience member says I'm wondering if writing poetry about the Armenian genocide has connected you more to your roots or to the Armenian community? Alan? A absolutely. Uh, two things. First, the poetry along with the history lectures work together like the logic and the heart, the mind and the heart. Uh, so even in Canada, when I'm doing seminars with facing history teachers, I find, you know, after a good lecture, people will say thank you. But after some poems, they may actually be moved to tears. So that's quite a difference in reaction. Interestingly enough, in Armenia, in, in the early first decade of, uh, of the century, I was known as a political science professor. Now I'm known as a poet. <laughs> so the poetry has certainly pulled me in to the Armenian community in more ways than just the political science. And I am a member of the Writers' Union of Armenia. So amongst my closest friends are a number of, of, of poets in, in Armenia. Uh, I've gone to a number of their workshops um, and that's been very uh, moving for me in terms of listening to their uh, family accounts, whether it be from Karabakh, from uh, the Republic of Armenia or elsewhere in the former Soviet Union. So lots of powerful, stories and um, the poetry I think um, is another form of communication and I think um, can reach people. The key point I think is it's not enough to know facts. You've got to have a reason to be engaged to help someone. And I think this is the power of poetry that just because you know the facts of history doesn't mean you're moved to, to assist those who are suffering. But I think the poetry helps um, uh, move uh, audiences, whether it be fellow Armenians or, or the general public at large. Absolutely. Yes, I agree. Uh, do you speak Armenian, Alan? Do you read and write and speak in Armenian? Not really, no. Uh, you know, I, I was able to order uh, items in the, in the restaurant and, and a few social greetings, but no. But it was interesting, you know, uh, 30 plus years ago, probably 40 years ago now, I learned Russian and I was a terrible Russian student, but when I was in Armenia in 2005, I realized why I had learned Russian <laughs> because the Armenian was almost impossible for me to decipher in those first years. Uh, in recent years, I've been able to read the alphabet, but uh, you know, I'll never command the, the language at any level of fluency. And I think my contribution is on the political history Sure. Um, yeah. Sure. And relying on others to translate, but we had some interesting challenges for the book *Return to Armenia* because it's a bilingual volume, and Armin Arsenian and I would sit down and we talk about what my poems were trying to convey because you've got to find the the cross-cultural equivalent, and sometimes you know what is resonating well in one country doesn't resonate the same way in another country. I'm always reminding my students that hockey means ice in Canada, but hockey means green grass in India, right? <laughs> nice. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, I'd like to jump to a question for Phoebe. Um, Phoebe, a lot of your work focuses on themes of identity and belonging. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about this uh, cultural duality that you have? 
um, how do you negotiate cultural duality in the poetic space and how do you use it as a tool uh, for poetic expression? And uh, after Phoebe, if, if uh, Teodros and Alan would like to answer that same question, by all means, please jump in. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I mean, the poems I chose for Zoran, you know, I, 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 I think were, were more about identity. I do also tend to write a lot about my mother and uh, uh, responding to works of art. But I think I was really concerned with the idea of belonging um, necessarily so because you live in this, a society that doesn't always acknowledge your experiences or stories or mirrors that. Um, and so it's always a sense of disconjunct. And um, when we lived in Ottawa, there were no you know, we had no other family there. Um, so the question is like, you know, how do I belong kind of came, you know, um, as a kind of an entrance. I think, um, you know, I've lived in Vancouver and now in Toronto, and I think it's less a question that's on my mind um, in terms of identity, because I now I think uh, identity means or, or you know, uh, many, many things. It's, it's always complex. It can be um, um, a kind of persona, I think, for, uh, your identity can, can you know, is very, uh, my identity now is made of, of, of now being, you know, an educator, but also, you know, a, um, um, you know, a Chinese Canadian woman, but also someone who, you know, has the uh, privilege of education. So I think to me now belonging means a sense of responsibility um, that, you know, you're not, um, you're claiming a space and just saying, you know, that I do belong because I am responsible for either um, the next generations, their learning, for your own learning and your own um, um, self-exploration, self-criticism for taking care of the land. Uh, so I, I think I, I, I stress out, I'm less anxious about it now because I think um, we're global citizens, um, we're diasporic citizens, we're all on you know, this, this turtle island or this planet Earth, and we have responsibility for taking care of, of what's around us. And so I think now I'm exploring what does that responsibility mean? Um, mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, Alan Teodros, would you like to answer the same question about cultural duality and how do you, how do you bring that to your poetics? Go ahead, Teodros. Okay, thank you, Alan. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, having uh, the experience to live in two different cultures uh, uh, makes uh, poetry even more possible, in my view. Because um, uh, you notice, you notice the differences, the cultural differences, the uh, the uh, uh, new new environments the uh cultural shock the uh uh, the, uh most importantly the uh commonality of humanity like how common uh, the, the, we have more common traits or qualities than differences uh, no matter what uh, you, you meet with different types of people uh, to work or uh, to uh, you know when you went to college. Uh, so uh, the, the humanity, the quality of humanity uh, overcomes uh, everything else, really, uh, when you think about it. So that, uh, that uh, reality, uh, I think, can make poetry like a bridge to connect people, uh, to, connect, to connect cultures. Everywhere, you know, human needs are the same. You know, of course, there, there are degrees of differences. You know, well, you know, the, a car may be a necessity here, but uh, you know, can be a luxury somewhere else. So, uh, but the basic human human needs, the basic uh, human emotions, uh, feelings remain the same. Uh, health issues remain the same. So, uh, when we are vulnerable in some areas, and all humans uh, act almost in a similar way. So. Uh, uh, being in two different cultures, completely different cultures, really, uh, uh, gives you a unique perspective uh, for you, you know, when you write poetry. So I think it's, it's a huge plus. Absolutely. Yes. Alan? Thank, yes, you, thank you. Um, my mother uh, grew up in the Middle East as part of the diaspora. My father uh, grew up in Canada. Um, 
and they met during World War II. So in our household, it was uh, the East meets the West. Uh, my father's in engineering and, and my mother was uh, very devout and mystical. So this, this notion of duality is very much present in, in, in my upbringing. And then of course, as an immigrant to Canada in the, in the early 1950s, Canada was very Anglo-Saxon dominant, not particularly tolerant. Um, over time, we've, you know, from the 1960s onward, and particularly in more recent decades, embraced multiculturalism. So I think cultural duality as an immigrant was always a challenge, um, even today. But in, in a multicultural Canada, it's probably in some ways not as much of a challenge, simply because so much of Canada is filled with immigrants or children of, of immigrants. The other interesting challenge is, as you travel extensively back and forth between, in my case, Canada and Armenia, and I was usually staying in Armenia for five or six weeks each year, um, at some point you feel like the outsider in both countries, depending on which one you're in. <laughs> and uh, that's both alienating in one sense, but it's also integrating in the sense that you become a bridge between two different countries. And I've said to the, the translators, you know, in the Writers' Union of Armenia, I've said, you know, you can be the bridge between uh, different cultures, even hostile cultures and countries. And in the South Caucasus today, I think um, the role of those who are with cultural duality as translators to help the dialogue is, is critical. So uh, paradoxically from alienation can lead to new forms of integration, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Very well put, Alan. Um, a question for all of you, uh, and if Phoebe could answer this first, I would very much appreciate it. Uh, you're a group of poets writing about issues of genocide, homeland, uh, dual culture, uh, dual cultural identity, um, diasporic experiences, and so on. Why poetry? What is poetry to you that you write it, that it appeals to you, that you've chosen to be a poet rather than a novelist or a painter or a musician? Uh, my parents are both painters, um, so I'm very fortunate that way. Uh, and so I think, um, you know, I did, I did grow up drawing a lot um, and painting a little bit. And I think what that helped having parents that appreciate art um, is that taught me to look very closely at things, um, be very attentive to color and to, um, you know, landscapes or the way things are framed and what's left out of those frames. Um, and, you know, I think I started writing just because, you know, I didn't want them hovering over me so much. And uh, it was kind of comforting to close my notebook, but also because my parents have so many stories. Um, and, uh, you know, I did also, I do also like to write other genres, uh, particularly um, drama. And I, I just started um, writing some short stories because I felt like, again, there were so many stories. But I think for me, poetry had the um that has a as a function that it allows a lot of play and um it allows for you know and i think this answers your previous question too about you know how is identity part of cultural practice is that when you learn to speak english and even when i grew up in canada you know i was learning cantonese as well as english the way english is is that there's a lot of slippages in it when you're not a native speaker of it as in the cultural values are being expressed in English and its idioms aren't cultural values that you're brought up with. And I think poetry allows for that, allows for you, know, you to push against very simple statements like I belong or you know, who are these, who are, are you a student? You would some questions like that and there's those slippages. So you can kind of play with a the irony there. Um, and that's something I really enjoy um, about, about poetry. It's like languages, it pretends, I think, to be solid, but you know, particularly when we're writing essays, you know, there's a, a, a meanings have to be very defined. But I love how poetry allows for that more lyrical or more um, emotional or that sonic quality to come through, where slippages can kind of happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. Alan Teodros, would you like to answer the same question? Go ahead, Teodros. Oh, thank you, Professor.
again. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, for me, it was, uh, I guess, since childhood, I, I was always uh, amazed by words. Uh, it seems like um, my parents used to tell me that. Also, interestingly, my one of my sons is like me, just like me. <laughs> so, uh, um, when I uh, hear words, and I, I used to pay a lot of attention to words as, as a little boy. And uh, in schools, we read poetry books, and uh, um, and uh, just I was exposed to a variety of uh, literature, and particularly poetry from an, an early age. So uh, I started putting words together. When I read something, I, I uh, or when I see a new word, I I connect it to something else, and uh, you know, just I used to experiment with words. So I, I'm just connected. With, I, I love words. And uh, I guess that's what uh, uh, attracted me to, uh, to uh, poetry. And I started then in grade school, like when I was in fourth grade, I used to, uh, in my notebooks, I even, even in, uh, like if it's a science or something, I, I, I put, you know, the, my notes in uh, poetic form. <laughs> So I used to uh, just do things like that. Uh, so I guess that's what um, they grew up with me, and uh, that's why. I got it. Yeah. Thank you, Tedros Allen. Well, um, you know, as a social scientist, I, you're constrained by the methodology and and the norms, mm -hmm. and uh, so trying to get to the more personal, the more emotional required a different form of communication and poetry served that, that purpose. Interesting enough, originally when I was an undergraduate, I thought I wanted to do uh, playwriting and used to teach uh, as a young professor, a course on plays and screenplays. But I opted for poetry in part because I was looking to take complex concepts and, and, and find the essence to edit, to prune, to find the core of the idea, the theme, or the message. And it's very much in the artistic tradition of less is more. What is the essence of, of that painting? And just, to, I'll give you one example. Uh, probably the most important poem I wrote was called The Verbs of Genocide. And its origins are, it, one year I was teaching my comparative course on genocide. And after two or three weeks of reviewing the literature on the theories and models and stages of genocide, the students were saying, sir, it's a military college, they say, sir, <laughs> um, you know, can you just give us a summary? And I, one night I was trying to reduce all these complex theories down. And the more I reduced them down to their essence, I realized it was a series of malevolent verbs. And so that poem, Verbs of Genocide, which has been translated into a number of languages, is just a minimalist poem that gets at the essence of all the academic literature that deals with theories and stages of genocide. Uh, now, lots of complications in reality, but, but I think if you're trying to convey effectively the essence of something, this is a good way to do it. And so yeah. that's the long answer to that question. Oh, yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. It's the compactness of poetry. And it's also its suggestiveness, right? It's openness to possibilities. Absolutely. Um, who are your poetic influences? This is a question to all of you. What, um, what poetry do you admire? Whom do you read? Um, I'll, I'll begin because uh, you wouldn't know any of them before. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we have the, the, uh, the poet laureate of Ethiopia, uh, his name is Sagai Gavramatan. Uh, he was, uh, he was, uh, he passed away some years ago. Uh, he was uh, an amazing poet. Uh, I used to have his books, his works, you know, by my bed, you know, before I go, I, I used to read his, his poem when 
was a teenager. So uh, uh, he, he was great. Uh, another one by the name of Kapuga Mikhail, who uh, uh, was also uh, great. But, but for, for English uh, poems, uh, you know, just um, English poems in English, the English language, you know, uh, I used to uh, read, you know, in college, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, poets, like from uh, the, the British poets, American poets, uh, Robert Bloch, of course, uh, the Lamston Hughes. Uh, I, I love the works of Lamston Hughes a lot. Uh, and uh, just there, there are many, but uh, there are just a few. So you're, you're going to write to me and provide me with a summer reading list, right, of Ethiopian poets whose work has been translated into English? Uh, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Phoebe? Yeah, um, um, I think, uh, like um, Tedro, I, I read, um, you know, had to read quite a lot of the British canon, you know, from, but you kind of learn to develop like your taste from that. Um, for the book that's coming out, Waking Occupations, I read a lot of Carl Phillips, um, the American poet. I'm a huge fan. I have like almost all his books. Something about his tone is so mysterious and elusive. I keep going back to it. Also, I'm a big fan of any, uh, the whole Grey Wolf Press catalog, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Maida Vang, um, and uh, 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 let me see who, who wrote Black Acre. And then, um, yeah, it, there's a de definitely a very uh, distinct U.S. poetics, which I find very courageous, and I think maybe a bit more outspoken than in Canada. But there's also, you know, I just finished reading for a, a prize book prize in the spring, and there were, you know, astounding debut poets. There was, um, I mean, I always go back to Dion Brand, um, mm -hmm. a Canadian poet here, as well as uh, Kinesia Lubrin, who is also now. Uh, poetry editor McClellan Stewart, her new book called This Graphist, which has just been nominated for the Griffin, and also Liz Howard, you know, she's a Anishinaabe, Euro Anishinaabe poet who um, lives in Toronto. Uh, and then, you know, I have a privilege of knowing a lot of poets, so their work. Um, an Iranian poet who I've known for a long time, is about maybe eight or nine years younger than me, has this wonderful new book called Intruder. Um, that is based on uh, having leukemia a few years ago, and I, I just biked to his house so I could get it, get wow. it signed. So yeah, those are some really wonderful. Uh, Thank you. Ones, yeah. Thank you, Phoebe. Alan. Well, once I got past the uh, thousands of political science and history <laughs> professors' writings, it's <interesting laughs> enough in, in our main library. It's mostly uh, plays. Uh, Mm. all wall of playwrights. Um, but in terms of the Canadian example, uh, I'm going to draw someone from the 1930s and 40s, F.R. Scott, Frank Scott, who was a political poet of uh, quite great prominence in those decades, less so today. But he was also very much a public intellectual. He was a law professor and one of the key figures in the social democratic CCF, which was the precursor to the New Democratic Party of Canada, and worked very closely with David Lewis, the uh, father of Stephen Lewis and the grandfather of Avi Lewis. So Frank Scott is the Canadian one. And then ultimately going way back, the Greek poets telling of uh, the odyssey of their people the epic stories, both oral and written traditions. And I think when you're trying to talk about the Armenian genocide and the survivors, again, it's the oral and the written tradition that's so important. Absolutely, good. this great summer reading for me from all three of you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in a word, so we can maybe wrap up. Megan, we have time for maybe one more question. Okay, in a word, if poetry is magical, of what does its magic consist? What makes poetry magical? Mm -hmm. Alan, would you like to go first this time? One word, transcendental. Uh, okay. Yeah, that it transcends, right. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, in, in some of my uh, poems, less about genocide, but some of my other poems, 
there's a, a mystical religious quality that uh, is certainly fitting in with the transcendentalists. Ironic for an atheist. <laughs> No, not really. No, because that's where you find your mystery, right? You yeah. find it in art, you find it in poetry. Yeah, it's not at all ironic. Well, yeah. it's the oneness of the universe and that we're yes, all absolutely. on this tiny planet. Yeah, yeah. That's that redemptive quality of poetry I was talking about. Yeah. Phoebe. Oh, um, maybe you don't agree. If you don't agree that it's magical. No, no, I do. I totally do. Because, you know, even when we look at transcribed spells, you know, that they're, they're always in poetry, um, uh, you know, and then it's, it's also has that, that, that Greek uh, quality of catharsis. And then also, as you said before, it's, it's transportive. And so you have so many things working at once that you, it's sort of like a sensory overload. You're like, oh my goodness, I'm being transported, I'm being healed, I'm being stirred up, I'm I'm getting, you know, it, I think it, it's a kind of time travel that transports you to kind of time and space, the emotional kind of landscape of that poet, which I don't really get from any any other form of art. Maybe dance sometimes comes mm -hmm. close, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Teodros? <laughs> It's a difficult question, but uh, <laughs> just to, see, to use a simple word, I'll say real. Real. Nice. Uh, Very nice. Megan, um, are, are we done? Did you want may, to? May I say something? Yeah. Please, by all means. No, okay. We still have just, time, just I think. Yeah. I, I have to mention it because uh, it's so interesting that I this invitation from the Zoya Institute um, and uh, just just to let you know that in Ethiopia uh, we have Armenian families uh, in fact we have Armenian uh, prominent Armenian Ethiopians in the in, the, in the, you know still today prominent families in Ethiopia in the, the, where I was born in Addis Ababa the capital you know they contributed a lot to Ethiopia's uh, uh, growth or Ethiopia's life. So I just wanted to mention that, uh, just that connection with the Armenian community. Thank you, Teodros. It's so wonderful to have heard you read your poetry and to share your thoughts, to share your poetry with all of us and to share your thoughts on poetry and poetics. Uh, tremendous learning experience for me. Thank you so much. And thank you, Megan and Jenna and the Zorian Institute for inviting us all here. Um, and I'll hand it over to Megan. Thank you so much. Yes, I, thank you all for attending um, today's um, presentation and today, today's event, Dialogue and Diversity. Um, thank you so much, Alina, to our host. My pleasure. Your poet. Um, for your interesting and inspiring contributions to this event. I, I, it was fascinating and I learned a lot through, through each, each piece that was read tonight. So thank you very much. Um, and if you'd like to revisit any portion of tonight's event, uh, we have recorded this webinar. Or if you wanna share with anyone or with your friends or colleagues, um, and we'll have it available on the Zorian Institute's YouTube channel. Um, and also on our website. So that should be up by tomorrow. So if you would like to share with your networks, um, it will be available. And okay. finally, to wrap up this evening's session, um, if you'd like to support the Institute's work, again, I'd encourage you to just make a, a contribution to the Zorian Institute. This can be done through a donation or by purchasing a copy of one of the Zorian Institute's latest publications, like I mentioned. And um, this book, Horses and Factories, does actually include beautiful poetry throughout and artwork as well from artists from all over the world. Um, and I think Jenna shared the links in the chat box, so they're there for you. You can click on those and the discount is available for you as well. If you have any questions for me about Zorian's programs and activities, you can send me an email at zorian at zorianinstitute.org. And I'd like to thank you again. You can follow us on, these are our social media channels to stay up to date on our work. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>